One of the great things for me about living in New York City is that when we have elections like we just had, one of the things we don't have to listen to is our politicians talk about their religious identity. We don't have to listen to those running for mayor or comptroller or public advocate blather on and on and on about so-called family values. We're lucky in that regard. But for lots of other American people, talk about family values is an important political test, even though the Constitution forbids such things. And the people on the religious right have been pushing that idea for decades now, decades, since the 1970s. They like to claim that these values, these family values, are clearly found in Scripture. But the Bible, friends, is actually rather short on family values as they are defined today. And that's actually rather shocking to lots of people. I used to know one of them. His name was John, and we worked together in a Midtown office. John was a kind and gentle older man, but as a gay man, he had been hurt significantly by religion. And so he spent a good deal of his adult life looking for all kinds of reasons to no longer believe in anything. And I perplexed him because I still believed, and he couldn't quite understand that. One day he came to my desk to show me a book he was reading about the Bible. He found it quite provocative and further evidence that this Christianity thing is a whole lot of hooey. I think he hoped it would shock me. But much to his dismay, I wasn't shocked because, you see, I have read the Bible. And I already know that our holy book is full of messy stories about messy people with messy morals. People like me. Struggling to understand God, what God expects of us as we walk on this earth. Where are the family values, John wanted to know, as he pointed out stories about the murderers and adulterers and thieves and blasphemers, all of whom are the ancestors of our beloved faith. The political and religious leaders on the right in Jesus' day were a lot like those in our day, but with one significant difference. In Jesus' day, there was no separation between church and state. Some of us still insist that in America there is. But in Jesus' day, the church and the state were exactly the same thing. The professional religious folks were a political power to be reckoned with, and they were divided, like we are, into two major parties, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the priestly class who controlled the temple ritual. They were liturgical people. They were sticklers for proper worship. And they were strict constructionists meaning that they only accepted the first five books of the Bible as being the Word of God. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, also known as the Pentateuch. They did not believe in continuing revelation. To even hear the words, God is still speaking, would have driven them to drink. <laughs> and since they only accepted the Pentateuch in since the Pentateuch makes no mention of life after death, they did not believe in the resurrection at all. But Jesus did believe in the resurrection. And Jesus had growing influence over the crowds. Every day his influence was growing, and this bothered the 
politicians known as the Sadducees, and so they decided to use this difference of opinion about the resurrection to trap Jesus and to expose his faulty theology. In a political move worthy of any modern politician, first of all, they got Jesus in a public place, and then they posed a difficult question, and then they waited for him to make a mistake so they could expose him as a fraud. They referenced a law of Moses that Jesus also knew that states that if a man dies childless, his brother should marry the widow and have children with her. In that way, the brother's name would live on and the wife would continue to be provided for. It's not exactly a modern feminist model, but remember that childless widows were often left to fend for themselves, having no rights of their own to their dead husband's property. So the Sadducees said to Jesus, there was this woman, Rabbi, who had a husband. But one day that husband died and there were no children from that union, so her brother married her. But he died too and there were no children from that union either. Then the third brother married her and died. Same story and on and on it went. All seven brothers marrying her all dying childless, and finally the woman died, probably from exhaustion. <laughs> In the resurrection, Rabbi, whose wife will she be for all seven married her? The crowd fell silent. All ears were tuned to hear Jesus speak a definitive word on this most important of all family values, marriage. Whose wife would she be? Oh, those poor Sadducees. Thinking that Jesus could be trapped so easily. But instead of falling into their trap, Jesus told them that they didn't even begin to understand what they were asking. They were looking for justification for what they already believed about family values and theology. And that is a terrible way to use the Bible, no matter which side of an argument you are on. So Jesus, whose wife will she be? Jesus replied, Nobody's. Because in the age to come, marriage is superfluous. In the age to come, people don't marry and nobody is given away in marriage. It's sort of beside the point because we'll all be like angels, children of God, children of the resurrection. <coughs> Now, some people interpret this statement of Jesus here as sort of being anti-sex, right? Angels don't have sex, so in heaven nobody has any sex. <laughs> but I don't read it like that at all. Instead, I read these words of Jesus as something completely new. He was saying something completely different. Laying out a different kind of family value system and one that his church ought to be preaching loud and clear every time we get the chance. Jesus was talking about the age to come, but I think that his words also have profound implications for the way we all live out the resurrection right now. In Jesus' day, the woman was the property of the man. Property. In Jesus' day, men regularly sold their daughters into marriage contracts, and the religious establishment assumed that this was the will of God. But 
Jesus turned their world upside down by declaring that in the resurrection, in that time when everything will be as it's supposed to be, this woman won't belong to anybody. This woman won't be called by anyone else's name. She will be called by her own name, her true name. And her name is a child of God, a child of the resurrection, an individual. Second, marriage is a wonderful thing. I'm married, and yesterday I presided over a marriage. But here's a newsflash. Despite what some people say, marriage is not the fullest expression of the love of God. It can't be. Because the love of God doesn't have any limits. And in the resurrection, in that time when things will be as they ought to be, we won't be bound to just one other person. Instead, we're going to be bound to every other person, as my first boss, the Reverend George Bailey, used to interpret this passage. Everybody will be married to everybody in the age to come. <laughs> used to terrify some people. <laughs> Love will flow freely between us. No walls, no boundaries, no contracts, no obligations. And those are family values Jesus' time. So do you think the Sadducees were satisfied with Jesus' loosey-goosey answer that day? Would this sermon convince a social conservative to change her mind? Probably not. But maybe that's not the point. Maybe this countercultural message of Jesus wasn't really for the Sadducees, those who already knew what they believed. Maybe Jesus was speaking to some woman in the crowd that day who had never heard her name. Maybe he was speaking to some widow in the crowd that day who had been left all by herself and on her own. Maybe his words were for a disabled man who would never know the joy of being married. Maybe Jesus was talking to them. And maybe his words changed their lives that day. And maybe our words do too. Because friends, in this world, if the church of Jesus Christ does not tell the forgotten and disadvantaged who they really are, who will? Who will? If the church of Jesus Christ doesn't go out into the world and speak words of life and affirmation to the lost and lonely and misunderstood, who is going to do it? If we don't tell them who they really are, children of the resurrection, who will? <laughs>